Yeah. That's amazing. I think we can handle this. Hey, watch. Uh, wow. That's. Oh, she. Watch out for that vaccination <laughs> shot. Oh. Jeez. Wow, that's little, yeah, little nice. Little hey, hey um, hi, hi, Greg. Hey, um, Jeremy, how you doing? Well, I'm um, fine. What's um, what's going on? This is so amazing. I am so ahead of the curve. Really? I am like way ahead of the hashtag. Yeah, here. yeah. This is so awesome. Get a look at this. These two like know nothing, no name writers yeah. write this silly book in yeah. Santa Cruz. Called what's it Rock. called? Well, it's called like Rise of the Naked Economist, and I am like so ahead of the game because I'm gonna start this trend about naked economists, and we're gonna go on tour, and this so, is my naked economist, so, so, and, so and Greg, I'm very Greg, happy about it. Greg, I think it's great. I mean, Greg, can you flex Greg, your muscles. Yeah. Um, that's so awesome. I I, I kind of need to tell you something. Yeah. What? Um, so I mean, look at so that. I, that's a work yeah, of art. I, I, he is a great naked economist. He's a I, naked I, economist. I, I, Rise I get of it. the naked economist. Except I had to you, Greg. I actually yeah. Um, yeah. with First, with Ryan economist. Kinnerty, I actually wrote the book that you're talking about. What is it? You're not a writer. It, well, uh, okay, but still, I wrote the book with Ryan, and it's actually called The Rise of the Naked Economy. Not rise of the naked economist. So even though I Lucas is great and I'm sure he's a great economist and maybe is even great naked oh. it's the rise of the naked economy. It's a book about the changing workplace. Not economists. No. We we do but, talk about some economists in the book, no, but, but they all have their clothes on. Uh, Greg. Can you can you change a title? Because look, no, I have no, this really no, great the, plan. Greg, I Greg, mean, look at this. The rise this gonna... of the naked economy. Is yeah. the name of the book, and it's it's about to come out. We're having a whole book signing uh, June sixteenth at seven thirty at Bookshop Santa Cruz. So it's, it's that's the book. It's got nothing to do with actually being naked. Wait Greg. a second. It's a it's a metaphor. What? Greg. It's a metaphor. Stop everything. Yeah. Um, oh, wait, wait, are you rise here to tell me? Economy. Wait a second. Are you here to tell me you're here to plug a damn book? Yeah, yeah. I wrote this book with with Ryan. My Put his clothes co on. We're leaving. Rise I'm of the done. Naked no. Economy. Ratchet. We're done. We're out. All right, we're back and we're fully clothed. Welcome to GTV, an offshoot of Good Times Magazine. Good Times has been around since 1975, founded by Jay Shore. I'm Greg Archer, I'm the editor of Good Times, and we have a great show for you tonight. Uh, first of all, Lucas, how you doing over there? Uh, pretty good, the weather's pretty chilly in here, but I like it because my nipples are really hard. Uh, I think that's great. Well, I think with a response like that, we're gonna have a really fun show. So um, why don't we just get right into it. Um, our guests tonight, are two titans of Santa Cruz, um, Ryan Coonerty and Jeremy Nooner. Ryan Coonerty, most of you may know, is a two-time mayor of Santa Cruz and co-founder of Next Space. And uh, Jeremy Nooner is actually co-founder of Next Space, among other amazing things. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank Thanks. you for having us. Thanks for yeah, having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. And of course, they're here because we're going to talk about their new book, Rise of the Naked Economy, How to Benefit from the Changing Workplace, which comes out in July. And they're book signing is at Bookshop Santa Cruz July 16th. You'll also want to look for the cover story in Good Times, which is coming out just before that. So welcome, both of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank Anyone, you very much. Please come down to the book signing. It'll be a fun night. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Well, the book uh, is interesting. Okay, so can you talk about uh, the genesis of the book and why you both wanted to write the book? Because you, know, you both found a next space, and which is a great thing here in town, and which is a sort of a next evolution of the work place and people working in uh, the new creative world. So I was curious what the genesis of the book was. Sure. The book is a, uh, it's really a product of our experience here in Santa Cruz. Jeremy and I were working together at the city when we realized there's a huge need to provide a platform for small businesses, one and two person businesses, to, to grow and, and have a community around them. So we started Next Space. Jeremy's done a fantastic job of growing it. And what we saw was a lot of people who were successfully navigating this new economy um, where they're gonna be on their own. They're gonna be freelancers, consultants, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, t contingent workers, and they need a roadmap, I, uh, we think, in order to, to find success and happiness. Nice, nice. And how long did the process take of writing it? Um, Ryan's idea to write that probably came about two years ago. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, Ryan's family owns a book sh bookshop here in town. Book Your family Shanker. owns a bookstore? They do. They do. Who knew? The Who knew? This book Anyone will be in the front half of the bookstore, and everyone else's book will be in the back half of the bookstore. <laughs> and and Ryan, Ryan had written uh, a, a book previously, a few years ago, uh, called Etched in Stone. And actually, we met for the first time uh, at his book signing uh, for that book at Bookshop Santa Cruz back in early 2007. Um, so books nice. and writing books have been in Ryan's blood for a long time. And so we uh, decided when we had had ideas that we think were are, are, are actually pretty visionary and pretty world changing, he said, hey, we have to put a book around this and, 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 and get these ideas out there. So uh, the we started kicking this idea around about two years ago, uh, went through a couple different agents and uh, finally got a great agent and found us a great publisher and we put the manuscript together in about six months or so. A lot of research we'd, be, we'd done prior to that. So it was about a two year process um, and a ton of fun. Nice, nice. Okay, so walk me through the book. So, uh, Rise of the Naked Economy. So the book is about the changing workplace, what's going on in, you know, in America and maybe beyond America at this point. Um, so yeah, walk me through the, the, the whole concept, the whole idea of, you know, what, you know I'm, a, I'm a reader, I'm gonna pick up the book, you know. Sure, we thought naked was a great metaphor for sort of uh, what the new economy has become. The old economy had a lot of adornments on it. We wore suits and ties. Uh, we had a certain way of dressing. We had casual Fridays. Um, and then we also had all the adornments like health plans and benefit programs and retirement packages and all these other things, paid time off. Um, and that's all slowly being stripped away through a couple big drivers. One is obviously technology. The second is um, uh, economics where people are outsourcing and crowdsourcing and doing a variety of different things uh, to save money. But the third big one is as, as a demographic change. You have baby boomers who are aging out of the workforce but will stay involved one way or another either because they want to or they have to. And you have millennials coming up who's saying we're going to work a different way. And so when you do that, um, you're a little naked, right? And uh, as we all know, being naked can be, you can be a little vulnerable, but it also can be some of the best times of your life when you're naked. Uh, Lucas, um, do you feel vulnerable at this moment? Oh, you know, but I like it that way. It's nice being exposed sometimes. You yeah, can just free nice your soul, so. free your heart. To well, <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll be here through the rest of the year, by the way, naked. Um, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. So no, ahead. no, no. So, uh, so like Lucas says, uh, it, you, can feel, you can feel vulnerable. You can also feel great. And our idea is, okay, so the, the economy's been stripped down, uh, we're at its essence, so let's figure out what the new economy looks like and how people can live happier, more productive, more sustainable lives. Because the old economy was nice for some people, but it didn't work for a lot of people, um, mainly women, young people, old people, uh, who d that economy wasn't set up for them. Uh, it, was, it was set up for the one you know, breadwinner household. Exactly, yeah. And so now that we have a new economy, let's figure out how we build the, the strategies and the policies in order to make uh, everyone a little bit happier and more productive. Nice. And so do you see, and does your book go into you know, uh, sort of the history of you know, the way things were and what's going on now and what, what people might need to know? Let's say if I am somebody who got laid off and I'm like you know, 55, I'm not. But if, you know, say that I am, because my brother, you know, worked at a bank, you know, for most of his life and now he's, you know, in his 50s and he's getting laid off and so now things are very much changing for him. So do you see, does your book go into um, next space type of establishments where people might coexist together creating cool things and working on their own individual projects, or individual new career routes? Yeah, I think we, we have our last chapter is sort of a very practical guide and we also offer a lot of different examples of people who were working in all kinds of different careers who were really working totally differently and happily. They're having time to spend with their family, their friends, their loved ones, whatever, uh, their, with their hobbies. And they've sort of figured out how to game this new system and we're trying to share some of those secrets with everybody else. That's smart. Sounds very smart. It sounds very smart. So how did you get involved in this? I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, no, I'm kidding. Uh, Jeremy's a great guy. No, Ryan's the, uh, Ryan's the looks and on the brains or maybe the other way around. Um, uh, we got involved in this, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs, we got involved in this sort of by accident. Um, we, we started X-Space here in Santa Cruz back in 2008. And the, the idea was to, to, to grow business here in Santa Cruz. And as Ryan said a few minutes ago, you know, we knew we had a lot of one and two person businesses in town. And if there was a way for us to get those people together, we thought, thought some really cool things would happen. And they did. 
But along the way, we realized that there was a much, much bigger trend that we were tapping into. Santa Cruzans are often, um, wittingly and unwittingly, pretty far ahead of, of, of a lot of trends. And one of them is this idea that by the year 2020, 40% of the American workforce, or 60 million people, are going to be contingent workers, freelancers, independent, uh, independent consultants, people who don't have a regular okay. full-time job the way we thought about it for the last yeah. 100 years or so. Um, so it's that population that we're really speaking to, both of what we do at Next Space and how we've put, to, how, how we've put the narrative uh, together for, for the book. So the idea is um, uh, work is being stripped bare, being stripped naked uh, from, uh, as Ryan said, all the adornments, the 401ks and the retirement plans and, and the benefits and the casual Fridays. And work is returning to what it's been for really the last 100,000 years of human work where you take your labor and your time and your talents and you exchange it for some sort of compensation. And that's it, you know? And then, um, and all the other stuff that we've built around work uh, is really just this weird anomalous blip in the course of the last 100,000 years. And, and how, do we, how do we get back to that? How do we get back to a society that's built around people being, uh, t uh, taking their time and their labor and their talent and exchanging it for some kind of compensation? And, and it's really, it's scary, as, as we've been saying, it's vulnerable, but it's also, I think, really freeing and really liberating and is gonna allow people, like your brother who got laid off at, 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 in, in his 50s, said, look, I don't have to go back and look for a job. There's other ways that I can take what I'm good at, what, what my experience is and what I know and turn it into a living. Exactly. So in, in your book, you also get into the insurance element of it too. And so can you talk a little bit about that? Because I guess in this day and age, if there's anything that makes people feel, people feel vulnerable, it is insurance. And I guess with everything changing next year with Obamacare and whatnot. So I'm curious about what some of the things you bring up about that. I mean, that's one of the things is that our, you know, we're in this business together and it's been growing and successful. At the end of the day, we're really policy dorks. Uh, we really engage on the, these public policy issues. And so one of the big ones is obviously health insurance. So employer-based health care is a unique United States phenomenon that's a sort of a quirk of the tax code 50 years ago. And what we argue is having employer-based health care when there are no more employers doesn't make sense. So we think Obamacare is a really good step in the right direction. And it's actually, we think, going to create a lot of entrepreneurs. We know a lot of people in Next Space who have great ideas, are ready to start their company, but they can't leave their current employment that they don't want to stay at because uh, they have they need health insurance. Yeah. So the net, the net effect is that when they leave their jobs, that would create an opening. When they start their company, they create more jobs. And we aren't creating all those jobs because of some weird quirk in the, in the tax code. We need to fix that. Yeah, yeah. have these golden handcuffs. We, one of the things that, that we discovered in, in, in researching the book is that uh, non-portability of, of, of health insurance or health insurance being tied to your job is the single biggest barrier to entrepreneurship in this country. It's not ideas, it's not money, it's not markets, it's not any of those things that are really hard to overcome. Uh, we, we have a great story uh, of an entrepreneur who overcame all of the typical things that entrepreneurs have to come over, uh, have to overcome in, in order to start their business. And the reason why he finally didn't start it is because he couldn't afford health insurance. Huh. And here we are at a time when every politician, every pundit is talking about innovation and job creation and how we need more and more and more of that. Um, uh, it's it's, it's company-based health insurance that is the single biggest barrier, we think, to economic growth. Wow. Wow. Um, it's fascinating to me because, you know, I, I t sometimes I think about my fellow writers in the world, you know, and I have a pretty good gig where I'm at, you know, because it's, you know, the paper and whatnot. But I think of the fellow writers, a lot of writers out there who struggle with, you know, like going out on their own, having their own insurance, or how, to, how does that work for them? So I imagine that's gonna change a little bit next year. Yeah, and it's funny because I think journalism is really has been on the front edge of this economic change. They were the, one of the first industries that's been disrupted. Now you're gonna watch lawyers being disrupted, accountants being disrupted, traditional sort of knowledge-based jobs that are gonna be disrupted in this yeah. new economy. And we're starting to figure out models of journalism. It's still, there's still a long way to go. But if we could figure out the business models and we could put in place good public policy, I think you could have thriving journalism. I think you could have a thriving economy overall. It's fascinating to me. So basically, you know, in this vulnerable place, uh, don't freak out, right? Don't freak out. Don't and, freak out. And there's a lot of people doing making it work. So figure out how they're making it work. Yeah. One like, of the best things about the book for us and researching it was we got to meet and we tell stories about really remarkable people. 
doing really interesting stuff, not just in the high tech world, but uh, in, in all sectors of, of, of the economy, who are, who are doing these amazing things and, and making a living and making a life. And they really are out on the forefront. And one of the things uh, why we think the book is going to be hopefully really well received is because these are really great, hopeful stories of, of people who are succeeding. And we want that to be uh, uh, inspirational for everybody who reads the book and everybody who cares about uh, uh, a vibrant, strong economy. Nice. So you mentioned in the book, um, among many other things, you were talking about the super specialist and the smart generalist. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, well, you want to? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll take one and maybe you take the other. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Which one are you? Uh, well, it's funny because we're both smart generalists, uh -huh. but don't tell anybody. Okay. Um, you didn't hear it here. So, uh, so we think that you're not that, a super specialist. That that the play you might be a super. I specialist. I think I'm a super specialist. Yeah. You're super something. Lucas is definitely a super yeah. specialist. Yeah. Lucas, do you feel super? I feel pretty good. Do you, you know? feel special? Do you feel special? Some people think so. All right. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. Lucas might be a really good example. That's the after show. Of the, of the, of the super specialist. And these, these are people in, in the naked economy who are really, really good at one thing. Um, and they are so good at it that they can literally can ply their talents uh, across the entire global economy. Um, wow. you're, the, you're the one guy who can develop this specific kind of iPhone app. You're the yes. one guy who knows something about this kind of law. You're the mm -hmm. one per woman who uh, is really good um, at, a, at a, say, a certain type of journalism or whatever it is. Um, that if, if you can be good at that and you can ply your talents across the entire global marketplace, then you can pretty much sort of write your own check. You can kind of have, a, you, you can construct your own living. So, so Part one is 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 getting really good at something and being one of these super specialists, and then this and the smart generalists are are the people who pull those super specialists together. Okay. Yeah, and a perfect example we use in the book of smart uh, of a super specialist is Jay Nichols, who lives up the coast. Yeah. Who's yeah. an expert in sea turtles, right? Yeah. He's the guy. He's a sea turtle guy. Great guy. Well, in a global economy, if you can be the sea turtle guy, you can make a really good living and and do some good in the world and and live a cool life like he does. Um, but the generalists are needed because at the end of the day, we're still human beings, right? And we still have to work together in teams in order to solve almost any problem. And if you have a bunch of specialists together who know their one thing really well, they're not going to understand how to collaborate or connect to the other members of the team. So you need those generalists to be the glue to pull people together because you're going to have to form teams very quickly, right? It's going to be like, like making a movie. You, you pull together this, the team that makes a movie. Then they go away, then you create another movie, and you pull some, some members of the team and new members of the team. And so we think the generalists play a really key, key role in that. And we're not doing a good enough job recognizing those people, the people who can know a little bit about a lot of things and are good with people, um, in terms of their role in the economy. Nice, nice. The book is fascinating. Um, we're going to feature it in a cover story in early July. Your book signing is July 16th, 16th at 7.30 p.m. 7.30 p.m. July 16th at Bookshop Santa Cruz. We all know it very well. Um, so before we part here, um, and I go on to another writer who is actually really cool too. Um, yeah, so what are, you guys, what are you guys finding most, in a, like a little nutshell, um, what are you finding most exciting about Santa Cruz right now? I think, I think that there's a, at the, natural, at the uh, natural History Museum, the Museum of Art and History, I think you have some really creative people who are looking at how we tell our story in different ways. And um, I don't know exactly how that's gonna play out in the larger sense for the community, but I think it's incredibly helpful. Nice. There are some uh, great startup companies that are getting a lot of uh, national recognition right now. Uh, you guys have. Humbly, Nextspace yeah. is, is one of them, and we're really yeah. proud of that, but we're not, we're, we're not the only one. Uh, a company called Privacy Choice, uh, which started here in Santa Cruz, was just acquired by AVG. Um, there's a company called Predictive Policing that's making uh, a big splash on the national and international stage. There's a company called Looker that is uh, also making a big splash. Uh, there's a new company called uh, Open Counter that's coming online. So there's a really a hotbed of entrepreneurism happening right now in Santa Cruz, and it's really exciting. Nice, nice. Lucas, what are you most excited about? Ooh, you know, I'm just excited to be part of this whole group. You guys are just awesome, and I'm really excited to get weird later with you guys. Yeah, we dig you too. All right, on that note, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. Hey, no problem. Don't Bring forget, July 16th, Bookshop Santa Cruz. In the meantime, 
I ventured out to the Santa Cruz Library and uh, where author, young author Nina Lutz, uh, who wrote ABCs of Fashion, amazing human being, check out this video and then we'll come back for more surprises. Hey, I'm Greg Archer with GTV, and we're here at the Santa Cruz Library where local Nina Lutz is uh, doing a book signing for her book, Fashion Animal ABCs. Nina herself has survived a rare form of cancer, osteosarcoma. Take a look at what she's been up to and how it can inspire you. Nina, 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 how are you? Good, thanks. Congratulations on everything. It's a big turnout. Yeah, I'm very surprised. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so take take us take me back. Okay, so it was about a year ago you were diagnosed. Is that true? A little bit, a little bit more than a year ago. So osteosarcoma is a bone cancer, and it's usually in people under or younger kids under like 20, um, and it's usually in your uh, legs. I had it in my femur. A lot of people I know have had it in their femur, and it can travel up to your lungs, and that's what I had. So I had a tumor in my right femur and in my lungs, and wow. yeah. Okay, so so there you are, your first diagnosis with this. What are some of the thoughts that are going through in your mind? Um, I can't believe I have cancer, because that was the last thing I expected it to be. They thought it was something to, that had to do with like my growing or scoliosis or something. At the time, I was really scared of throwing up. It was like one of my biggest fears, and that was the only thing I cared about. I was like, oh no, chemo makes you throw up, and yeah. I couldn't deal with that. That was like actually my worst fear, so. Yeah. You were 17 at the time, right? I was, yes. Okay, so then where did the idea come? So there you are. I mean, you basically drew your way through chemotherapy, right? So t talk a little bit about how the artistic process helped you and, and, and what happened and how did it form into like, oh, I want to do a book on this? Well, um, I was doing a lot of art because that was something you could do that wasn't active. And I, I was on crutches and I couldn't really walk around. And um, I was really tired most of the time. And so I, could, I was able to sit down even on some of the worst days when I had mucositis, which is like this infection in your mouth and you can't, you can't talk, you can't eat or anything. And so I would sit there and just draw. And that's when I actually did most of these. And I could do two in a day. And it, was, it would feel really good to have something that you produce on a day that otherwise would just be completely wasted, you know? It, it, was, it wasn't a lost day, so that was, really, that was really nice. And I can look back at my time that I've had cancer and, and it's not a, like a completely lost year. I, that's, yeah. Exactly, you turned it to good. Yeah. And on those really hard days, sometimes she'd come up with really her greatest artwork. Um, you know, like she did Zoot Suit and, and she did the Emma's for, uh, you know, mini skirt. She did that on a really tough day. And it's, you know, she couldn't even talk or anything, but then, uh, you know, she'd have this great piece of artwork at the end of the day. And I think that just really kept feeding her and, to, you know, motivated her to keep going and, and do more. <laughs> Asked for the next letter. What, what page have you done this week or what letter have you done this week? So I kind of watched the process of the book be made and it was so exciting and I would tell the kids she did the L today and she's doing the M next week and so when the book finally came to my classroom it was a very very exciting day. How did you come up with the idea to go I'm going to give the proceeds um, of this book to the good cause and can you tell us the cause again? Yeah so I had this problem I felt so helpless and dependent on people like I hated it I was I couldn't do anything for myself and everyone was doing all this really nice stuff for me and the nurses were amazing I mean I love nurses because they're so sweet and they've done so much for me so I, I was trying to think of a way that I could give back and I couldn't write a card to everyone and do a drawing for everyone that's helped me so I thought if I made a book and donated the the money to Lucille Packard so they could hopefully work on a cure or anything that helps advance so just treatment gets better and better. Well, Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, you cannot do a kindness too soon for you never know how soon it'll be too late. Is that, that's a quote that you like, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what is it about that quote that you find appealing? Well, I mean, clearly you never know when something like cancer or any type of accident is going to happen. And it's so nice to feel like you have nothing, no, no regrets that you've done everything that you want and you can live with that. And now as a survivor, I'm glad I've done everything that I've done because I could have donated more when I was richer and more famous or, you know, but I'm glad I didn't wait and did it now.
Here to sing a song off their great CD, We Love to Party with Everybody, is Free Flavors, and it's only six months after National Butt Day. So, oh. ah, six months to the day. And the song is called It's Your Butt. So yeah. here we go. It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 It's your butt, na 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 na